I will briefly mention that I am one of the co-founders and the CEO of Forest Neurotech. We are a focused research organization, which is a new type of nonprofit meant to bridge the gap between kind of academic parallel small efforts and the larger, more kind of industrial focused product market fit startup world. This valley of death has been a long-standing problem in science. We're hoping to plug this for neurotech and get us over a few scientific hurdles and uh, technological hurdles and open a new field, field building. Cool. I'm going to start with a couple operating definitions because there are many definitions in this field of what a BCI is and is not. I'm going to include two things, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm not talking about today because it's way too wide of a topic. First, a brain-computer interface, a device that reads physiological signals using some sort of technology from the brain directly or the central nervous system, converts that via some sort of decoder into the control of a cursor on a screen or a robotic arm, and ultimately, usually the source of feedback there is visual. You can see the, uh, the feedback through the visual screen itself, or you can see the robot moving, but typically it's not like a direct feedback. That's not always true. Sometimes we do the other thing, which is closed loop neurostimulation. So now we're actually reading brain activity, doing something with that, making a decision, and then actually stimulating brain activity directly. This can still happen in motor prosthetics. So you stimulate somatosensory cortex to create the percept of feeling or touch. Or in some cases, you might want to correct a disease state. And so instead, you're actually perturbing the brain towards more normative or healthy brain states. I'm going to come back to all of this. I did put in the bottom here, this guy is human. I'm going to talk mostly about human BCIs, just to kind of narrow the scope a bit. Um, I am not going to talk about all of these really cool things that I would still consider to be part of BCIs, genetic modifications, all of the kind of techniques and use cases that are out there. There are so many that just covering them in one talk does not seem feasible. I'm not going to talk about connectomics because June is going to do a way better job than me. Um, I'm not going to talk about whole brain emulation necessarily, although you will see many pieces of what would build whole brain emulation throughout this talk. I'm not going to talk about pharmaceuticals. You could argue that those are the most successful neurotechnology to date. I don't want to minimize that, but I don't have time to talk about it. There's probably tons of other stuff I'm missing, so don't be offended. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about the past, the present, and the future of neurotech. So I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, and the kind of beginning of neurotech is a hole in the head. It's not particularly uh, sophisticated, but it does do some interesting things. So if we go back like seven to 10,000 years ago, we actually see Neolithic people. It's prehistoric, trepanning their friends or family members. And it was thought, or Anthropologists say it was probably because they were trying to release the spirits that were responsible for the erratic or strange behavior of someone who had recently fallen and hit in their head. These days, we'd call that a traumatic brain injury, and we would probably drill a hole in the skull, but more in a medically controlled environment to relieve pressure. But in some cases, this actually worked. So these people knew that if you put a hole in the skull, in some cases, the person will actually recover. And we know this because we'll actually see bone growth back in the skulls of some of these humans. So occasionally, this was actually successful at saving someone's life. So that's maybe the oldest neurotechnology I can think of. Um, Hippocrates really kind of brings us into the modern era by saying, OK, it's probably not demons. It's actually this organ in your head called a brain. And I think it's pretty amazing that many of the mental disorders that we still use today, this lexicon, this field that was built by Hippocrates, we still use these. These are thousands of years old, things like mania, melancholy, insanity. These are still in our modern lexicon, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, Luigi Galvani discovers that if you stimulate frog legs, then you can elicit a response. So this is kind of early neurotechnology saying, oh, electricity is doing something interesting here. Maybe we should push hard on that. Um, Jumping way, way forward and many, many steps, I'm going to jump into kind of the modern era of neurotechnology. And I think what most people would defensively call neurotechnology today, and that's deep brain stimulation. So uh, Robert Heath is a somewhat controversial figure because of the many, many ways in which he used DBS. Some of them were very ethical and amazing, and some of them were less so. Um, and there's some interesting books written about him. But one thing I want to point out is that through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he has this incredibly large lab setup these stereotactic systems, and he's dropping these very long, thin electrodes into human brains for people who are, have very treatment-resistant, difficult forms of neuropsychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar disorder, and the list goes on and on. He tested this in a lot of stuff. Um, but it wasn't until 1967 that we see kind of an amazing breakthrough here, and it didn't actually come from the field of neurotechnology. 
It comes from cardiac pacemakers. And so I want to talk about this idea a little bit later, that often the advances that we see in neurotechnology that we say, wow, that was really a quantum leap forward, didn't come necessarily from within the neurotechnology field itself, but instead from adjacent fields that have large commercial markets that substantiate and fund research teams that can create new, novel, amazing devices. So in this case, entire teams at Medtronic were developing uh, these pulse generators to stimulate the heart for a cardiac pacemaker, which would have sounded like a very scary prospect in the 1950s. You want to put something in my body, in this case, nuclear powered, which is really cool, um, that if it stops beating, I die, or it doesn't really kind of beat faster or slower when I go up or down stairs. And so this really shifts the Overton window, not only for what is possible for implants and, and implants that are keeping you alive, but also for the technology itself and what it's capable of. And some really smart people get the idea that we can piggyback this. We can take this device because the pulses that we generate for the heart aren't all that different than what's been done in these, these investigational studies like from people like Robert Heath. So they get the idea that we might be able to inhibit pain if we just stimulate the spinal cord. And all we have to do is take a traditional cardiac pacemaker and turn up the frequency. And that actually works pretty well. And suddenly you've gone from this huge lab setup, multi rooms, many racks, lots of complicated equipment that very few researchers have access to or the expertise to run to something that you can ho literally hold in your hand. And this really drives the field forward. Um, deep brain stimulation is still the most successful hard neurotechnology today. There are hundreds of thousands of these implanted now. Um, primarily, this is for two accepted use cases, the central tremor and the tremor that's associated with Parkinson's disease. It's also approved for OCD, um, although there are fewer people implanted for that. And now groups are trying to get this approved in other indications like depression. But it is kind of magical to see what these things can do. So before this device is implanted, this, this man who has uh, Parkinson's disease, you can see this pretty insane tremor. And by simply turning on the device, that effectively goes away. Now, there are some real limitations to deep brain stimulation, which I'll come back to in a second. But I think it's still a pretty magical demo. OK, so, so far, I've really been talking about stimulation for therapeutics. So put something in the brain put it in electrical discharge, it changes the, act, changes the activity of neurons firing, upregulating up or downregulating, and hopefully that causes some therapeutic effect. But the BCIs we tend to think about when we talk about BCIs are actually sensing. And this doesn't go back quite as far. So Hans Berger in 1924 was the first person to measure electroencephalography. So you can see him sitting here with a picture of the brain in the corner. So this is the first time we're starting to see human brain waves. Now, for everyone that's not familiar, electroencephalography is a non-invasive way of measuring the, ma the uh, electromagnetic fields of uh, summed neurons. So you're talking about millions of neurons that happen to have the same orientation creating these small fields, and you kind of measure these microvolt signals non-invasively from the scalp. So it's, not, it's a relatively coarse technique with low signal-to-noise ratio, but even back in 1924, we're getting good signals from it. Um, I kind of talked about that. All right. Jumping forward, the first closed loop BCI that we see is in 1969, and this comes from a postdoc at the University of Washington named Ed Fetz. And this is in a non human primate model. So he puts an electrode into the brain of a non human primate, measures how often neurons are spiking. So neurons, when they're active, create these action potentials and they kind of pop, and you can literally hear them on a speaker. And for people that have done electrophysiology, every time you hear one, it's very magical. Um, so he does this and starts counting the spikes. How often is this neuron spiking per second? And then I'm going to put that on a meter in front of the, of the animal. And the animal is then trained to bring that meter up and hold it at a particular firing rate. And if he does that, he gets a sip of juice. Um, monkeys, like me, are very food uh, rewarded. So they're very happy to do this and work for juice all day long and control that individual firing rate. This tells us a couple things. One, BCIs are possible. Here's a closed loop. So again, we're sensing function. It's being decoded in a very, very simple manner here, right? just counting up bin spiking rates. And then it's giving feedback to the monkey in the form of the, the visual of the meter and at the same time in the reward. And it's also enforcing another concept called operant conditioning where you can train the animal to do this just straight through reward and then it becomes very natural. And you can do that for a single neuron, which is pretty cool. Um, brief uh, tangent, 1972, just to keep this in chronological order, is when we start to see non-invasive forms of brain sensing. Um, here, this is just anatomical. We're looking at the first CT scan on the right. 
which required literally like shuttling tapes back and forth between universities, but nonetheless, amazing to see what a whole brain image looks like for the first time and how far we've come today in resolution, but ultimately that the technique itself has not changed a great deal. Okay, by the 1990s, now we've taken the single neuron and uh, replaced it with many neurons. Now we're putting many electrodes into the brains of monkeys. If you look in the bottom right corner, you can see this monkey here with a couple of wires coming out of his head. These are attached to electrode arrays, and now we're sensing tens or potentially even hundreds of neurons. In the early studies, it was in the tens. And one neuron might be responsive when the monkey's imagining or attempting movement to the right, another one to the left. And you can start to combine these together using simple machine learning linear models to say, if I see these firing rates combined together, I can predict what the intended direction of movement from that monkey is. And then from that, I can have him control a robotic arm. And if he reaches out and grabs this little black bar with the robotic arm, then he gets a sip of juice. And so I think this really forms the foundation for what most people talk about when they say BCI today. I think expanding that definition is important, but this is the traditional motor neuroprosthetic that we start to see in the 1990s. And I'm, I'm happy to present it in this context because you start to see this through line of electrophysiology all the way from Luigi Galvani in the 1700s to the way that we think about BCIs today. Um, then we start to take that uh, forward. I, that's wrong. It shouldn't say 1990s there. It should say 2006. Um, so these are the first motor prosthetics in humans. And this is in the brain gate group. And so here, the same sort of idea, electrode arrays implanted into the brain parenchyma itself. So you're actually in the tissue. And then recording up to hundreds of neurons at a time, decoding that for all different types of use cases from prosthetics to screens and so on. I do like to show this video because at the very beginning, if you didn't catch it, uh, the participant was playing Pong. And I'll come back to why that's kind of interesting in a minute. Let's see if it loops around. I think it does. Maybe not. That's OK. He was playing Pong, trust me. OK, present state of the art. So we've talked about the past, a little bit of a whirlwind of different snapshots through history of where BCI and neurotech has come from. Where is it at today? So this is actually a video from my co-founder, Tyson Aflalo at Forest Neurotech. Before uh, that, he was the executive director of the Brain Machine Interface Center at Caltech. And this is one of his patients, uh, James Johnson. And I like to show this video because if, I, if you didn't already know that this person was paralyzed from the neck down and had electrode arrays implanted in their brain, and I was just told you, hey, this is someone playing video games, you would think that's somewhat unremarkable. Yeah, they're actually even pretty good. But what's amazing about this is that this person has no movement below the neck. And they're sitting there playing this with nothing but thought. And so I think this is where we're seeing motor neuroprosthetics um, sort of plateau these days, is they are getting very, very close to what unimpaired people can do with our existing limbs. And we're seeing this across a broad range of uses. So another example comes from the Stanford group in BrainGate. Here, again, same form factor, electrode arrays, decoding. But rather than decoding, in James's case, we're kind of doing thumbstick decoding. So he's trying to move his thumb, but of course that doesn't happen because of the spinal cord injury. Here, the person's imagining handwriting, so moving their entire hand, and then decoding the motor loops, all of these kind of funny shapes that we create with our hand as we write. And that actually allows this person to then, that types out effectively like a keyboard, but he's just imagining handwriting. I like to highlight this one because it's sort of showing the same thing through a somewhat different paradigm, but still a motor neuroprosthetic in the end. This person is able to handwrite at a, almost exactly the same rate that most people on average in this room would be able to handwrite. Um, there are a number of commercialization efforts. This is the loudest part of neurotech at the moment that I'm sure you all see in the news. Um, the big one is Neuralink. And I like to show this video um, because everyone kind of lost their minds when they saw this monkey playing Pong. They're like, oh my god, we've done this thing. And it's like, well, we did that in 2006 with humans, but that's OK. What's really remarkable here, and I think sort of gets lost in the sauce sometimes, is that there's nothing coming out of this monkey's head. It's what you don't see. There are no cables. There's no huge research team that has to be in the room making sure that everything's going just perfectly. Um, this is a fully implanted device that the monkey voluntarily uses to get juice. And then they go sit under a little charger. It looks like a hair dryer for a little while. And it charges it up. And then they go back to work. And they're happy to do this in an open environment. This is a huge technological tour de force to get this from these sort of very kind of crude electrodes that were developed in the 90s all the way to something like this that has wireless telemetry, wireless charging. Um, it's pretty amazing. And I don't want, I single out Neuralink because they have the best demo videos. 
but there are other groups that are doing this too. So Paradromics, BlackRock Neurotech, Synchron, all of these groups are really driving forward the field of electrophysiology-based motor prosthetics. But these are not the only form factors you can do. Others are finding that you can start to make this less invasive, and there are still really, really useful um, use cases. So I hope the sound works. I didn't actually test this, but let's give it a go and see. So this is from Eddie Chang's group at UCSF. And here they're using ECOG. So this is surface electrocorticography. So it sits on top of the brain, doesn't actually penetrate the brain. So it doesn't cause any damage, but it does require a fairly large opening. So the surgery itself is a little bit riskier. Um, but once the thing's in there, it works pretty, pretty straightforward. All right, let's see if this works. The group that you're seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. Okay, so a little bit of insight into what's happening there. So electrocorticography, rather than measuring single neurons popping away, it's measuring the summed activity of thousands or maybe millions of neurons, depending on your impedance. And then you kind of grid this over a large region of the motor cortex and start to decode what is the tongue doing? Because the tongue is ultimately part of the motor system. What is the larynx doing in the, doing in the voice box? And then you can reconstruct that through two end-to-end -end neural networks, one that kind of reconstructs the motor system and one that deconstructs the, the brain state. And they have some kind of low latent space in between them. And from that, you can reconstruct speech. Silent speech would be a pretty amazing BCI application because now, even for people that can't speak, or people that don't want to speak in a particular scenario, you can imagine that they're actually able to communicate at full bandwidth the way that you and I would communicate, but without actually making any sound. OK, so that's all very well and cool, but there are some limitations to what I've been talking about so far. So I'm going to kind of pick on DBS here a little bit, but I don't think it's unique to DBS. Everything I've talked about so far is largely based in the motor system. So even though DBS can seem magical in that demo that I show you, Parkinson's disease is not just the tremor associated with it. It also has speech problems, it has mood problems, changes in cognition and balance. It is a multifaceted disease for which neurotechnology today can only treat one small aspect of that. And furthermore, Parkinson's disease is just one potential application among many, many, many for which are, there are many people today that are treatment resistant, have severe forms of these disorders, things like bipolar, anxiety, depression, OCD. These vastly outnumber the people with severe forms of paralysis by a factor of 20 to 1 or so. So there's a lot of disorders and many systems that are associated with them that the motor system that we're gathering with our current neurotechnology is just simply not keeping up with. And that's largely because, and I'm going to pick on depression here, but it's true kind of among all of these. These are the brain networks that are associated with depression and some of the underlying phenotypes. And if you take a look at them, they share a few traits in common. They're, first of all, these nodes in the networks are spread widely throughout different regions of the brain. Um, it's also worth pointing out that these are not consistent from person to person. They vary from person to person. And ultimately, they also change over time. So you might look at a person on day one, and then a year later, it has literally, these nodes have moved or changed their spatial or temporal patterns in a way that you need to update. And so that brings me to the future. What do you actually need from neurotechnology to be successful? And I'm going to argue for whole brain input output. Um, this is not like read write in the sense of like patterning memories or like decoding thought at that level. So I just want to like clear that up from the beginning. I'm talking about the ability to measure brain function widely through the brain and to stimulate specifically different areas in the brain, but again, with the choice of where you do that in the brain. So I'll do a brief foray on our company, Forest Neurotech, where we are developing less invasive, so these are epidurals within the skull, but outside of the brain in the dura mater, uh, minimally invasive ultrasound-based implants that allow us to image function throughout the entire brain in humans, and also stimulate specific regions anywhere within the brain. Um, this is an example mock-up of what one of our implants looks like. If you're curious, I have a couple in my backpack. You can come check them out later and actually see the chip inside. It's pretty cool. Um, but this brings me to my point, which is I think the next generation of neurotech will have a few key attributes. First is this large scale, again, to address those circuits and systems that are spread everywhere. It needs to be adaptive so it can be personalized to each individual person's uh, symptoms and disorder. 
And then, of course, it needs to be capable of both read and write. And I think that that is going to be a key for all future neurotechnology that we're even seeing in things like deep brain stimulation is the closed loopedness of this. So just stimulating and hoping you have the right effect has only taken us so far, but is effectively hitting walls. We need to understand the function that you elicit when you actually create that stimulation. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into this, but just to quickly point out, even the Neuralink with its technological tour de force that's amazing, if you took six of those and implanted them next to each other, you would only cover about 1% of human surface cortex. And that's not including any of those deep brain regions or midbrain structures that we know are so important to the vast majority of these diseases. And so scaling electrodes alone is a very, very difficult proposition. I'm happy to talk about some kind of scaling laws on how that could take a very long time and ultimately I don't think is the right solution. Um, this is kind of just an illustration of what we want to cover in the brain, but I'll show you some data in a second. So the idea is based on two techniques. One is functional ultrasound imaging, which is a problem I spent six or seven years working on at Caltech, which we kind of ping ultrasonic energy into the brain. We listen to the backscattered echoes. And over time, if we compound those images and filter them correctly, we can actually start to see changes in the spatial temporal patterns that are indicative of red blood cell motion. So red blood cells scatter ultrasound waves slightly differently than tissue does. And we can start to filter that out and see where blood flow is changing. Why do we care about blood flow? Uh, as neurons are active, they use metabolic resources, things like oxygen. And that has to be resupplied via the bloodstream. And that happens at a very, very local scale, down to the kind of micro capillaries and arterioles that are actually perfusing these small regions of neurons. And so by measuring the blood flow, we can infer that localized neural activity. We're also using focused ultrasound neuromodulation. So we can take these same devices, which are an array of ultrasound transducers, in our case, almost 9,000 of them. And then we can energize them at different patterns. And that will form different shape beams. So we can expand the beam to get really big imaging. Or we can focus it down, and much like you know, burning an ant with a microscope, which maybe don't do, but um, similar idea. We can focus this beam down to specific regions in the brain. And then by literally mechanically stre stretching and squeezing the neurons, some subset of neurons in the brain have mechanically sensitive ion channels in the cell body that actually allow you to up or down regulate that cell's function. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but if you're willing to combine that with things like sonogenetics, so genetically modifying the brain, or delivering drugs, you can do all sorts of incredible basic neuroscience, which is another reason this is like such a great idea for an FRO, so we can share this among as many different potential use cases in both research and clinical translation as possible. Um, so these are the kind of two basic techniques that led um, to these types of implants. Um, so I'm going to show you some data that uh, is like fresh off the presses. This is from last Friday. So you're going to have to do a little bit of interpretation with me because we have not cleaned these up. These are grainy. These are first off, you know, first that we've done. But nonetheless, on the left, I'm kind of showing the illustration, which is an MRI with some kind of overlaid simulation. And on the right, I'm showing you actual data. Now, if you look, you can sort of see the bottom of the brain here. Um, it's kind of out of view here, but you would see the skull on this side and the skull on this side. And if I then show you this, I'm going to overlay the actual function. And you can see the blood flow. I'll have it kind of pulse in and out. Um, so you can see an artery here that's going to be perfusing really large regions of cortex. Maybe not a ton of information, but it's a good biomarker or a good biological landmark. And then we can see the function overlaid on top of that. So this proves a couple of things that were open questions when we started the FRO that are technological hurdles. One, can you miniaturize ultrasound and at the same time, to miniaturize it, you have to put it on silicon chips. Can you develop the pressures that are necessary to get the depth and scale of the human brain? These were open questions. So the answer was yes. And then second, can you pulse them fast enough and often enough without breaking them to do the types of imaging that we need to actually detect function with sufficient sensitivity? And the answer is also yes there. So we're about eight, nine months into this FRO. This is the sort of thing that could have taken literally a decade plus in academia. And like six months in, we have working chips in human beings collecting functional data. So we're just like super, super excited about this. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Whoever did the whistling, you're my friend. Um, OK. So I want to touch on a few principles that I just keep noticing again and again in the field of neurotech that I think are really going to catalyze future efforts in this space. So one of them is using advanced tech from other fields. 
So I touched on this earlier with the pacemaker, but in the same way that groups actually took something from cardiac pacemakers, which is a huge field with lots and lots of economic incentive to develop miniaturized devices, and then bring that into deep brain stimulators, we're trying to accomplish something similar. So at Forest Neurotech, we partnered with Butterfly. Butterfly Network is a publicly traded company. They're much larger than us, but they have been spending years, decades, in fact, developing this ultrasound on chip based technology that for them is for a point of care ultrasound use case. So this is for a doctor to use on a heart, a lung, a liver, anywhere in the body, and you have this handheld ultrasound probe that then connects into your phone or your tablet and allows you to see inside the body. That's a pretty amazing technological feat that cost on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, something that would have been very difficult to justify even for very large neurotech companies like Neuralink. So for us, if we can partner with these groups and say, hey, you've created something that in your field was very expensive and useful, it'd be difficult for us to replicate that. But if we work together, maybe we can bring that into the field of neurotech. And rather than these scanners, like I'm showing you on the left here, this is like what we were using at Caltech, that is a million dollars worth of scanners. And you need an entire team of people to run these things with a background in wave physics and programming and FPGAs. And if you're lucky, you'll get the thing to work. And there's only a few labs in the, in the world that are actually doing this successfully. We want to go from that to something that literally fits in the palm of your hand and at the same time increases capabilities because that rack only gets you up to 1,000 channels. And in fact, at Caltech, to go fast enough to have the data rates we needed, we could only do 128 channels. This has 8,960. I have one in my backpack. We have dozens of them lying around the office. And they're costing on the order of thousands of dollars, not millions. Um, and then as we move into the future, another, another kind of key insight, I think, is moving beyond the motor system. So I've already hit on this a couple times. But we want to get from a place where we are now, which for something like DBS, you have the implant, you have the use case, you have the delivery method. And all of that gets bundled together and evaluated by regulatory and reimbursement agencies as a whole. But as we move into an era where rather than having an individual notepad and calculator and email app, it all is actually running in software. So this is, I kind of hate the overused analogy, but it's a little bit like a smartphone for the brain, if you will, where by actually just programming the delays in that array, you can change the use case and function of what the actual neurotechnological implant is doing. And I think that's the direction we're headed. So what applications does this buy you? So we've talked about neuropsychiatric and cognitive disorders, so I'll talk about some fun BCI stuff for a second. Um, this is from Jack Gallant's group uh, at Berkeley. And so on the left, this is a, a clip that they presented to people. So they're watching this video while they lie in an MRI scanner and have function measured in their brain. And then on the right, we take the data from their brain alone and try to reconstruct what did they see just from the whole brain functional activity. This is blood flow with much, much coarser volumes on the order. We're about 800 times more precise by volume with ultrasound than they were with MRI. And even still, they're able to do this reconstruction. I prefer to actually show this older one. This is from 2011, because this is like pre-easy access to generative networks. And so you can, this is a very simple model. So it's a more replicable result, I think, easier to interpret what is actually coming from the brain versus today. It's a little hard to disentangle what's coming from the brain versus what's generated by the ANN. Um, new forms of communication. This is sort of similar, but a little different, where if you can look at infertemporal cortex, again, using fMRI, you can reconstruct faces from face patch networks in your brain. And so you can literally, you know, I'm a terrible sketch artist, so even if I have the best motor BCI on Earth, it might take me hours to try to sketch something out, and it's still going to look like a stick figure if we're lucky. But with something like this type of BCI, you could literally imagine the face of a loved one or someone and actually recreate that almost instantaneously. Um, semantic networks are tiled largely across uh, large swaths of the brain. We can take those semantics and then actually feed them into LLMs, for example, and literally recreate entire stories together with AI. This is kind of you know, merging things a little bit. Um, so there, these are some of the new forms of communication that we're thinking about that go beyond the motor system, looking at visual and semantic representations throughout the brain. Um, and then I want to kind of touch on a couple concrete examples of other ways in which people are using ML and starting to get closer to AI. And I think that's where we're headed. So this is inferring single trial neural population dynamics using et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What that means is on the left, you see some uh, activity from a monkey. So if you just try to reconstruct these uh, coordinated movements from the monkey on a single trial basis from neural activity alone, you get these kind of messy strings of activity. But what you actually want is on the right. And what you can do is pre-train large networks that are regularized to the types of motor behavior that you would expect in a monkey's brain. 
and then from that transfer learn onto a you know n plus one monkey and reconstruct much smoother trajectories. This is some of the first examples I've seen where you could argue this is getting into AI territory where you have a foundational model that is then extended and tuned on a new person or a new monkey in this case, and that creates a better outcome. Still in the motor space for now. But we're now seeing this starting to extend beyond the motor space. So this is MindEye 2, similar to what I showed you before, showing people images in a scanner and reconstructing them. But often that takes like tens or, in this case, 40 hours of lying in a scanner to train the network. That is not a fun thing for a patient to do, to lie in a tiny bore for 40 hours and try to stay awake while they watch videos. But if you can train a foundational model on, in this case, seven participants, then on the eighth participant, they can come in and with only 30 minutes of calibration data, you can tune the network to do decoding in that N plus one person. Again, sort of showing sparks here of AI where now you're training a foundational model and benefiting from it. So this is too wordy, but we're gonna do it anyway. Large language, language models have done this very well. They accelerate workflows just by simply, quote unquote, predicting the next token or word, and they generalize across many use cases and uh, people. So similarly, many groups are talking about building foundational models for the brain. This is what they're talking about. Better therapies, massively accelerating neuroscience, and that all comes from quote unquote, predicting the next token or brain activity in silico. Um, and ideally then we can start generalizing across people and use cases. And that's what actually allows us to kind of move into the AI era. Now there's still a problem, and I'm stealing from the school of Andre Karpathy Twitter, which <laughs> is to say that for true good AI, transformers have been around since 2017, the breakthrough really came with scale, and scale was really only useful because you had the scale of data. And so we had a few things. One, a huge quantity of data. In that case, basically scraping the entire internet. But you also had very high quality data. There's not a lot of noise in the images that you're picking up. And even if there are, that's good for regularization if you have enough data. And then finally, a wide diversity of data. So you're not just picking up on Reddit threads or just picking up on WebMD or Wikipedia, but actually the combination across all of these. This is what we're currently missing in neurotech. We do not have a huge quantity of data. It is very difficult to collect data with our existing techniques. We do not have a great quality of data. These are biological signals that are squishy and noisy and difficult to filter. And finally, we don't have a huge diversity of data. Most of these are controlled in lab settings and you know, or in an MRI scanner or a dark room, moving a cursor on a screen. Very, very simple paradigms. That has to change to look more like naturalistic behavior in the real world. And it's once you have these three things that you start to benefit from the models that tell you a great deal about the brain and allow us to accelerate. Um, and that's what kind of then, to, you know, what does that all buy you in the end? It allows you to move away from just paralysis, which is still very important, but relatively small number of people, into these other areas like depression, anxiety, OCD. And eventually, once you can start to tune the mood states associated with depression or the compulsive states associated with OCD, there's no reason that you can't expand that to less impaired people and eventually non-impaired people. And this is the kind of natural Overton window shift that we've seen occur with things like pacemakers and the neurotech field is ultimately relying on. But I think this is the pathway, starting with paralysis, through mental health and cognitive disorders, and eventually into these spaces. Um, so I'll stop there and take some questions and hopefully have a nice discussion. But if you're curious and learning more about ultrasonic BCI, we just had a paper come out like last week. So this is just me being shameless. Go read it. It's fun. We did some transcranioplastic imaging in a human. Um, and there's a couple other papers. So with that, just thank you for listening.